and welcome back everyone it is time for some more space what you got for us uh, this week jp so today i figured i'd talk about uh some different types of orbits so you know hmm. I, I think people are aware there's a lot of different satellites up there you've got you know the space station the space shuttle you got hubble you've got you know wherever satellite tv comes from you've got <laughs> whatever the nsa's got going on up there mm -hmm. watching everyone so you know are these things all just kind of hanging out together or where where are they all at so I figured we'd break this down into a couple different types of orbits that are pretty common around Earth. You've got uh, low Earth orbit are where most satellites are. Uh, this pretty much uh, defined as anything lower than 1,200 miles or so. That's okay. where you're going to find the space station, uh, basically all spacecraft since Apollo, or definitely all spacecraft since Apollo. Uh, the Hubble, you're going to see stuff like, um, uh, for instance, spy satellites are, tend to be at this altitude because that mm -hmm. way they don't have to look as far to get like nice photographic images of what's going on on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, you see, uh, you know, just like some communication satellites, like for instance, the Iridium constellation is uh, like dozens of satellites that are essentially, uh, it's like satellite phone, basically. They're hoping to be, before cell phones were ubiquitous, they were hoping a satellite phone uh. would be a thing and made this mad rush to launch all these satellites. And in the meantime, cell phone tech towers got a lot cheaper and these guys promptly went bankrupt. Mm. Uh, but they're actually, you know, they'll, they'll hopefully be adding more satellites up to low Earth orbit soon since they're trying to get back at it. But mm. uh, but yeah, so low Earth orbit's cool because uh, you can see a lot of this stuff from the ground pretty easily, uh, and there's just a lot of really, um, you know, like this is where, you know, for better or worse, this is where a lot of the human stuff has been going on lately, which makes it kind of intrinsically interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little more crowded than the other areas because it's, uh, you know, s smaller since it's, you know, so much closer to the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, so you end up with a lot more debris and, you know, stuff like that to watch out for at those altitudes. Mm -hmm. But um uh, and also, I should point out that a lot, most of the stuff, even though we define it as being lower than 1,200 miles, tends to be lower than that, uh, just because you don't want to drift up too high into the Van Allen belts and bake mm. whatever spacecraft you are. <laughs> uh, <Yeah>. Highly radioactive. <laughs> <laughs> now, how do they manage? I mean, you know, I envision it's kind of like this this giant Tetris puzzle where you know you're going to launch up a satellite and you got to you got to you know figure out where that's going to be in that orbit so you don't bump into anything else. Right. So one thing to keep in mind is while there is a lot of stuff in space, space is still really, really big. Sure. So, you know, it's not super hard to find an orbit that's going to be clean. Mm. Uh, the way they do it is uh, it's the Air Force that actually tracks all radar, uh, via radar, all objects bigger than 10 centimeters or so. And they mm. have this massive database. They update it as frequently as they can. They can figure out, you know, what orbit something's in and they can use atmospheric modeling to figure out, all right, well, if it's this big, it's in this position, the atmospheric drag will be this. So mm. it's orbit change like this over time. And then, you know, they might check you back in on it a little bit Whoop. later to see if they were right oh, and refine the model. We just and froze. We just froze. So oh. we, we, we may need to back up and, <laughs> and start that, 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 that sentence again. Uh, where did he freeze on? Um, I, I just restart with um, the... Air Force uh, tracks objects yeah. 10 centimeters exactly. and greater. Yeah, so um, so the Air Force actually tracks all objects in space uh, in orbit about 10 centimeters or greater. Uh, they can't really get much better resolution than that, unfortunately, but that still tracks millions and millions of objects. Wow. Uh, most of this are you know active satellites, defunct satellites, pieces of defunct satellites. Uh, and that's actually how they uh, warn the ISS to, you know, like, hey... We got a piece of debris that's going to be entering within five kilometers of you. You might want to take some sort of invasive action, uh, and you'll see the you know the astronauts go and hunker down in the uh, Soyuz and wait for that to go passing by. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so low Earth orbit's got a whole lot of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of on the other extreme is a uh, geostationary orbit. Uh, this is a very interesting orbit where so if you look at satellites in low Earth orbit, they kind of go whizzing across the sky very fast because they're going around the world, you know faster than we are rotating. Mm -hmm. If you go further up, they would appear to rotate slower and slower and slower until you hit a certain point, a magic point at around 22,000 miles, where you are orbiting s and at such a speed that it takes a full day to do one orbit, which uh. means that from a point of view of someone on the ground, you're just hovering there, mm. assuming you're over the equator. If you're not mm. over the equator, you kind of trace out this figure eight called an analemma that's pretty close. Mm. But uh, uh, so. What you end up seeing, if you look at, uh, like, for instance, like you know, if you look at pictures of you know, all Earth satellites, is you'll see this crazy ring around the Earth because it's mm. this natural resource. It's kind of like the radio spectrum. You can't fake it. You can't invent your way around it. If you want to be in one place passively over the Earth, you have to be at this orbit. Mm -hmm. uh, so you see a lot of like uh, Direct TV hangs out up there, satellite TV. So you'll they'll park one satellite up there, uh, point it 
down at, you know, for instance, North America with like, you know, dozens of antennas and mm. people point their satellite dishes at it. And since it's not moving, the only guy to do is point it once. Uh, gotcha. And then they've got satellite TV. Uh, one of my favorite fun facts to point out is if you're ever lost in a city in the northern hemisphere, look for satellite dishes because they all point south because they're all pointing towards the equator. Ah, Urban pathfinding smart. there. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's also fun to figure out who's faking satellite inter uh, satellite uh, TV, which is apparently a thing. There was a place uh, in, I saw near Boston where there's this big satellite dish that always pointed east. I'm like, man, what are you pointing at? Ah. <laughs> uh, You'll also see stuff like, uh, you know, speaking of spy satellites, you'll see like signal intelligence satellites up there. So, mm. you know, kind of like radio spy satellites. Mm. Uh, and they kind of keep these parked about a thousand miles apart or so mm. uh, in this big ring. And, you know, since it's, you know, a natural resource that they can't ever, you know, make more of, what, they're hope what they try to do is they really strongly encourage, like, if your satellite is done, please boost it to a different orbit. So they'll mm. boost it to a so-called graveyard orbit, about a thousand miles higher, which mm -hmm. doesn't take too much fuel. It's not that big of a deal. And it's just kind of a useless orbit, but it's close. It's easy to get to, and no it shouldn't bump into anything once it gets up there. Mm -hmm. Now, once you get into that orbit, are they still geostationary? No. So at that mm. point, they would be going from the perspective of someone on the ground slightly backwards from mm. where you would expect to see, you know, like a low Earth orbit. Like, you know, so I guess it would depend on which way they're going, actually. But mm. yeah, I mean, so, you know, they would definitely no longer it would start to drift around the, uh, around the Earth from the perspective of someone sitting on the surface. Gotcha. Um, and, and will that eventually um, sort of drift outwards from Earth? No, so mm. they would need extra energy to be able to drift further away. Uh, I mean, the way I'm sure like, at some point you'll either drift away or drift into the Earth over mm. very, very long time scales just because mm. of how uh, you, know, you start factoring in stuff like, well, how much is Venus tugging on this satellite? Or how much is mm. Jupiter? And it's super, super, super small. But over the course of like thousands of years, it starts <laughs> to add up and it'll start getting a little bit wonky. And eventually it will either dip down low enough that the atmosphere will start grabbing at it again. Or mm. you're right, it could end up getting knocked around enough that maybe it just you know, kind of gets tweaked over to the side a little bit and a stray mm. asteroid goes by and pulls it and, and drifts away. Mm. But wow. practically speaking, it's just going to chill out there forever. <laughs> <laughs> Until and, we can invent something that can go up there and just collect it all. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I've heard theories that, like, you know, if humanity ever wipes itself out, you know, the geostationary ring of satellites will be there for tens and thousands of years and be evidence that, hey, we were here. It'll be like the modern pyramids. <laughs> oh, that's cool. <laughs> Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I read some, something that one of the um, things they look for in, in uh, uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence is looking for signals of that. You know, can, can we find sufficient concentrations of, uh, of satellites? Yeah, absolutely. Like, if you can see a bunch of, like, radio signals coming out that seem to be coded in some way, it's like, well, these probably aren't coming from, you know, quasars or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so another class of orbit that uh, is less popular but still important is the medium Earth orbit, which, as mm. you can guess, is somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. uh, here you typically see stuff like the one that I always know off the top of my head is GPS. Mm. So GPS is typically put in about uh, those satellites live in about a 12-hour orbit. Uh, so they just kind of slowly trundle around the world because mm. um, it's not important for them to be in one place at all times because, you you know, you want to make sure that if you're in one place, you've got, you know, you kind of can cover more of the world that way by making sure they're all kind of drifting around. Mm. Uh, but you also don't want it so low to the ground that your phone goes, hey, I got one, and it's gone. Uh. So, uh, like, and what's cool about this, actually, is you can look up the real-time position of GPS satellites, even what your phone can see, and it'll show you, like, you know, like, hey, you've got like four satellites you're talking to right now and show you their relative positions. And they're just kind wow. of always hanging out up there, uh, you know, essentially doing no more than sending out a very high precision uh, clock and you know, saying, mm. I'm right here and here's what time I think it is. <laughs> you know, if you get a bunch of those, if you get four or more of those satellites talking to you like that, you'll know exactly where you are. Yeah. And it, I mean, isn't GPS just kind of amazing how quickly that became a fundamental technology? Yeah, absolutely. Gosh. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I remember back when it was still relatively new, I'd heard like the mm. military was still kind of fuzzing it for <laughs> civilian purposes because they weren't sure. It's like, this is like, we're going to let you guys use this, but this just giving you all of Be careful. Seems weird. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Only accurate <laughs> to uh, this level. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> at, at this point, though, they've got so the American GPS, there's uh, European, I think they call it Galileo, just because mm. it's not confusing enough having every probe, we, mm. everything called Galileo or Pioneer <laughs> or Pathfinder. Uh, mm -hmm. And then. Um, the Russians have GLONASS, which was uh, mm. it was a GLONASS satellite as the unfortunate payload on that proton rocket, oh. a little belly flop. So 
Oh. Yeah, so there, there's multiple all going up at once, and for now they kind of cooperate, but I think they all want to have their finger on the button. If things go sideways, they could be like, all right, GPS is gone. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. That'd be interesting yeah. to see how they handle that. Um, Definitely. So another type of orbit that's a little more temporary is you've mm. got specialized transfer orbits. Hmm. So, like, for instance, if you hear SpaceX is launching something to a geostationary transfer orbit, what that means is rather than launching into a nice round orbit around the Earth mm. or up to a nice round orbit way up in geostationary, they'll put it in this big, long ellipse where, like, the bottom of the ellipse uh. is about 200 miles up or so, and the top of it is a couple thousand miles higher than geostationary orbit. So hmm. the satellite, the, the rocket just kind of chucks it up there and says, all right, contract's done, good luck, spacecraft. And the spacecraft goes up there, and what it'll do is when it gets to the top, it'll do a little burn to raise its periapsis, the bottom of the orbit, mm. and then go back down around and do a little burn, do a little burn. Mm. And this is why you'll hear about satellites becoming operational like months after they're launched, because it takes them a while to get into the right orbit, and they start doing, mm. you know, like, all right, is it working right? And we do some tests and all this, and finally they go, okay, you can watch TV now. <laughs> so you'll see uh, those temporary orbits like that a lot. Interesting. So is, is that kind of um, there kind of to, to give it a... Um uh, a base orbit that you, you can then adjust to make sure it gets to exactly the right orbit or, or you want? Right. So, I mean, mm. theoretically, they, a client could say to SpaceX, look, we want you to put us in the final orbit, but I think it's just a matter of, you know, it's more practical to, you know, allow the client to handle that so they can use their mm. smaller thrusters and get to exactly the kind of thing they want. Mm. Uh, you'll also occasionally hear about uh, if a satellite is placed in the wrong orbit, they'll end up burning a lot of their fuel to kind of bring themselves closer to mm. the proper orbit. So you'll mm. see stuff like... Um, Oh, what was it? There was a satellite that was placed in almost the right orbit, and it took these and these engineers spent months and months using all this attitude control fuel mm. and managed to get themselves to where they needed to be after all. And mm. it was just kind of crazy, like <laughs> like piece like foot by foot, we're gonna get there. Ah. <laughs> I suppose that uh, diminishes the life of the satellite as they use their solid fuel. They have mm. limited options for keeping it where it needs to be. Yeah, exactly, because one of the main limiting factors of a satellite staying up there is its station-keeping fuel, because even mm. if you're at geostationary orbit, you're going to kind of drift a little bit with solar wind and other satellites mm. and everything pulling at you, so they use a little p -p 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 and just kind of push <laughs> themselves back, and if they run out of that, mm, so... Can't refuel. Can't no. refuel. Uh, <laughs> you know, they've been looking into that kind of stuff, but that might be a topic for another show. Oh, uh, nice. That would be a fun one. Yeah. yeah. And what then, what uh, do you do when you run out of gas and yeah, yeah, <laughs> the nearest gas station's twenty two thousand miles away? Yeah, mm -hmm. come on, come on up here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course, the last type of orbit that uh, they mm. will talk about here is the escape velocity, which is arguably mm. not really in orbit. Mm. But for instance, if you were going to Mars or Mercury or, or you want to go visit the Sun, you uh, you can't be around Earth anymore. So they basically just keep you know. They do a burn so long that the top of the orbit gets further and further away until eventually it effectively it goes to infinity. And so mm. you're no longer in an elliptical orbit, you're in a hyperbolic orbit. And mm. you'll just drift away and you've achieved escape velocity. The, Earth, the planet or uh, gravitational body can no longer hold on to you and you'll just mm. uh, effectively, you, the way to think about it is you would arrive, you would slow down to zero uh, meters a second at infinity. So you kind of asymptotically uh. get slower and slower. And mm -hmm. this is, uh, I'm sure anyone who's played Kerbal Space Program will be very familiar with the <laughs> moment when the ellipse mm -hmm. snaps into a, a, a hyperbola and off you go. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so those are probably the most temporary of orbits of this list. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's what you got to do to get off the planet. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, is, that, that makes sense. Cool. That's, that's, that's fascinating. So there are other orbits besides these? So there's um, sort of. like So you'll mm. see some kind of interesting orbits. Like, for instance, you'll see you know, highly elliptical orbits, you see something for like a sp science vehicle, like, you know, see certain mm -hmm. telescopes or the MMS mission, which I should definitely mm -hmm. talk about at some point, yeah. be in this very, very elliptical orbit where they kind of pass through all these regimes at once. So mm -hmm. you'll see like the bottom of the orbit may be down around 300 miles or so on low Earth orbit, mm -hmm. and then it goes uh, passing up through uh, medium and up uh, near geostationary or even, I'm not sure there's anything that goes past that. Uh, mm -hmm. In, like that, but yeah, you'll see. Like I think Ch the Chandra X-ray Observatory is mm -hmm. in this really wonky, highly elliptical, highly inclined orbit that just kind of like whenever you look at like all orbits of satellites, it totally stands out as just like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's that's really cool. Yeah, nice, cool. Um, anything else? Uh, I think that's it for this time. So I just have to come back next time. <laughs> Sweet. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. We'll see you all next time. Thank you. <laughs>